It's Wednesday night. And your theater barn is, is live! Welcome to New York Theatre Barn's New Work Series Live. I'm Joe Barros, and I'm the Artistic Director. And I am Jen Sandler, and I'm the Associate Artistic Director. Tonight, we are excited to present excerpts from the new musicals Metropolis and The King's Wife. Metropolis is the new musical from Aradai Knox and Brandon Webster, and The King's Wife is the new musical from Melissa Annis and Grammy-nominated songwriter Jamie Floyd. Yes, so like every week, welcome to the 13th season of our new work series and the 27th every week this number gets higher and it's insane and amazing. 27th installment of our virtual series since March. And with all of our virtual programming combined, we have presented 56 new musicals, lit up, lifted up the work of 96 writers, and made space for over 250 artists. And we have partnered with Broadway On Demand, and like every week, we are simulcasting tonight to Broadway On Demand. That's right, and we also created Theater Barn Records, which is a new imprint of Broadway Records and dedicated to original musicals in development. Right, and in collaboration with Broadway Records, Theater Barn Records released our first album, Willow, last month on September 25th. That's right, and the album debuted at number seven on the Billboard Cast Album Chart, and Willow is available wherever you stream music. It's pretty great. We also wanna thank you for everyone who attended our Seat at the Table fundraiser event this past Monday. It was really such a special and extra stimulating conversation, and we are in awe of the amazing panelists we had and what they had to say. The conversation was just so special and I can't wait to watch it again. We'll have it available on our channel very soon. And we are excited about another very special event coming this Monday. That's right, this Monday, October 26th at 8 p.m. Uh, please note the special time. We will present our final Choreography Lab of 2020, new technologies, endless possibilities, taking inspiration from theatrical television events. The lab will be streamed live to a global audience from Broadway Dance Center here in New York City. Emerging choreographers Tuan Malinowski and Kristen Yancey will each work with an ensemble of dancers to create choreography from a never before staged musical. Yeah, it's so cool. The lab will explore excerpts from the original musicals, I Don't Wanna Talk About It by Ben Kaplan and Sueños, our American musical by Jesse Sanchez and Jeff Chambers. Both shows, as you may know, have been featured in our new work series and we are excited to be continually involved in the development of them. That's right, and for the first time in the lab's history, we will also feature a new mentorship component pairing each choreographer with an established mentor choreographer. Joshua Burgos, Tony nominee Joshua Burgos, will mentor Tuan Malinowski for I Don't Want to Talk About It, and the great Maria Torres will mentor Kristen Yancey for Sueños. 
Yes, and we've partnered with Full Out Creative who will collaborate with the choreographers to discover new ways of presenting dance for the screen while also working with our New York Theatre Barn team to evolve its programming and theatrical storytelling systems. That's right, and now more than ever, we need uh, you know pieces that sort of meet at the intersection of film and theater because our entire world has changed. Both choreographers will also join lab curator Avital Asulin for a conversation about creating dance for the stage versus the virtual stage. And most importantly, we are approaching this exciting hybrid opportunity with the health and safety of our artists and team members at the forefront. Exactly. We wouldn't be doing this if we weren't confident safety was there in front of us and we're excited about what we're presenting. We hope you will join us for this thrilling and sure to be special night. The event will be free and you can watch it and stream it live to our channel and it'll be on Broadway on demand. And now to tell us more about how you can support New York Theater Barn is one of the co-writers of Sueños, Jesse Sanchez. Hello, my name is Jesse Sanchez and I'm coming to you from my home in Ashland, Oregon. My show, Sueños, Our American Musical, was featured in the New York Theatre Barn's New Work series last fall, the virtual New Work series earlier this spring, and will come to life with musical staging for the first time ever in the New York Theatre Barn's Choreography Lab next Monday. Pretty excited about it all. Sueños is an original Latinx musical that follows three generations of a Mexican-American family in their pursuit of the American dream. The New York Theatre Barn is excited about tonight's original culture-shifting musicals, The King's Wife and Metropolis. The New York Theatre Barn is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and your gift tonight is tax deductible. Thank you again for supporting live theater and the development of new musicals. Enjoy the show. Thank you, Jesse. We were so uh, thrilled to have Sueños be a part of our uh, Newark series last December. And then in our virtual Newark series, which is this platform here, and uh, next week in our choreography lab, it'll be the first time, as we've mentioned a few times now, that the show will be on its feet. And we're thrilled to support um, this Latinx musical um, about uh, three generations of a family in search of the, Amer the American dream. Absolutely. And actually, I think both shows next week, it'll be the first time they're truly on their feet. So it's really something so special and we're just so grateful to be given this opportunity to these artists. So look out for Monday. So last week's new work series featured the new musicals, Love and Southern Discomfort and Present Perfect. And here is a clip from last week's presentation of Love and Southern Discomfort. Take a look. Think about the time that we could have had and then never tried to get away. Nothing in the world is beyond a grasp. You and me could be royalty. Don't you see this is hard for me. I really miss it, but I don't regret. Our duo began because Bobby and I, uh, he was an alumni of Book of Mormon as well. So I was, you know, trying my hand at, um, you know, being a playwright. And so I said, Bobby, I think I wrote a play with music. And so I said, can you take a look at it? He sat with it for like a week. And then like seven days later, he came back with three songs. And we've just been rolling ever since. My family's from uh, Lovisport, Louisiana. And so I grew up with stories of the homestead and every summer, probably until I was about 15 or 16, we all have those feelings of not being good enough. And so, I mean, the theme of the show is just love cures dysfunction. To give love, even when someone is at their lowest, they need to know that they're not going through it by themselves. Just don't try to build me up while you're breaking me. I kind of was like in, in between these two worlds. And so um, my grandfather, he was a piano player. And uh, I just, I never felt like he got his due because growing up in the segregated South, you know what I mean? So I kind of like built this story around my grandfather and uh, all of our like colorful relatives, you know, and, and the family land. And that's where the story came about. About like the family ties that bind, it's about dysfunction. Um, and it's about staying tethered to one another, even when it is so difficult. Come on and take her. Walk down the wait a minute, wait a minute. Come on, come on. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, oh. Okay, I'll take her. Walk down the relay. Come on, take my hand and let me be a man. Walk down the relay. Trust in you, trust in you. Trust Walk me, baby.
I was totally just dancing to Memory Lane. <laughs> I've been singing Memory Lane all week. I just love Nikki M. James, and I just love Ramona Keller, that song, The Courage. Remember CDs? I wore out the CD of Brooklyn, uh, especially the songs sung by Ramona Keller and Eden Espinoza. So it was very exciting to have Ramona on last week. <clears throat> they all get to be in this show, and we can't wait for it. That's right. And the show was actually directed by Tamara Tooney as well. Well, and now here's a clip from last week's presentation of Present Perfect. Take a look. Mi Peru, am I forgetting you? As I walk the busy streets, miss your sounds around me. Feel your hills surround me. that I read about what was a show, immediately I sent an email to Nancy and I told her, no, I, I mean, I mean, I want to, to be your partner to tell this story. These are, these are the kind of story that I want to tell. And at that time, I was in process for my artist visa. And it turned out that my lawyer was a scam. And he, and he stole all my money. And I have to go back to Mexico for three or four years. I mean, this is my immigrant story. A couple of days before we were supposed to fly back to Mexico, I told my wife, to this day, and we stayed. We did a show. Nancy came to that show at the New York Music Festival, and we reconnect. They're very hard choices to make. You know, I mean, Sarah, when she sort of is separating and, and having to make decisions that separate her from her, you know, sort of religious community, um, it, it's not, it's not, it's not easy choices, and, and they're never black and white. How could I know what I didn't know before? Uh, how could I know what places there were to explore on the sight? On the smells of world that I had never seen. Subway stops away. This dope is bad, no dope is good. I feel so turned around, I'm like a stranger in a foreign land. The universality of, um, uh, you know, wanting to belong and wanting a home and, and what is home and, 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 and how we find it and, you know, who's your, uh, your family. Yeah, for me, I mean, every single character in the show has a little bit of me. I mean, so it's like uh, my own story as, a, as an immigrant as well. New York, will you ever feel like home? God. Wow. My mother and my brother both texted me after last week and they're like, wow, I guess we're gonna be hearing from them again. This, yeah. this show is so spectacular. Jaime is really uh, a really important voice on the musical theater scene. And I think we're gonna see a lot from him. Right, I mean, everything about him being the next Lin-Manuel, it's all true, absolutely. Even Lin-Manuel says it. <laughs> so you know it's true. Well, now let's get started with tonight's shows. Our first musical tonight is Metropolis, which has a book, music, and lyrics by R. Dinox and Brandon Webster. Metropolis is an epic tale that follows the harmonizer android unit turned space-time continuum anarchist Fari as she is wrenched across space and time. With the apocalypse hot on her heels, in the past and the future, Fari keeps finding herself at the center of world-defining moments. But will she be able to withstand the upheaval or will she crack under the pressure? Ooh, and now joining us from their homes are the writers of Metropolis, R. Dinox and Brandon Webster. Hi, everyone. Hi, guys. I love Hi. the description because I'm like, oh, the drama. <laughs> Yes, it's so dramatic. He also read it so, so dramatically. <laughs> yeah, I, I read it a little dramatic. I saw you almost fall out of your seat I back there. It. I like <laughs> it. That's how you read it. 
Well, we're so thrilled to have you. And um, we first heard about the show and you as writers uh, through Musical Theater Factory's uh, Makers Profile video, because uh, you are part of Musical Theater Factory's inaugural Makers cohort. Yeah. Um, our friends at MTF are incredible. Musical Theater Factory is an artist service organization <laughs> dedicated to dismantling oppressive ideologies towards collective liberation. Uh, and um, through uh, the Makers cohort, artists were chosen for their innovative groundbreaking work, their commitment to, to stories from underrepresented communities, and their vision of how musical theater can transform our culture through paradigm shifting work. So um, that's, that's how we discovered you. And in that video- um, Which he watches I, like once a week, I'm not even joking. <laughs> just to see what- um, That's really flattering. Paradise book it really is. Like, <laughs> John, do you hear that? Because I saw your comment pop up. So do you hear that? They watch your video at least once a week. This John? Yes. I that John, <laughs> yes, that John. It's the editor of that video and the cinematographer behind it. So. So in that same video, um, I was really inspired by, inspired by what Art I said. Uh, she said that this show is for an audience that believes in joy as a revolutionary force. Mm -hmm. And uh, Musical Theater Factory's yeah. artistic director, May Antio, who's uh, currently in Singapore, was quoted saying this about both of you and your show. We are going to build something better. These are prophetic lyrics from Metropolis. Aradai and Brandon's brilliant musical. These words resound powerful today as protesters around the world gather to protest police brutality against black people, bringing us hope and purpose in these troubled times. So as writers who, re who view art as protest, it seems that your work meets at the intersection between art and policy. Your collaboration was born at a round table hosted by Musical Theater Factory. Yep. What See, I did my research. Ooh, I didn't what, even know that. Yeah. yeah what? Natasha Sinha and Zakari um, Jones. Yep, uh, made the thing happen. Made the awesome. thing happen. <laughs> awesome, we had Sakari on our show. She's a fantastic writer. So Incredible. what was the moment like when you discovered that you needed to work together and how have places like M MTF given you the wings to fly? Do you wanna um, tell the story? Sure, I'll tell the story. We okay. both tell it slightly differently, so you you can correct me when I'm wrong. <laughs> but um, we both went to POC Roundtable, and um, we're like hanging out. Like the POC is such a it's such a great space. Like it feels like family, yeah. even your first time going there. So we were like presenting work. I had this really weird sci-fi play that I'm still working on that A was like, it's not a musical, read it anyway. And they were really nice to me and let us read it anyway. And Brandon heard it. And then Brandon presented work from Headline. And I really loved it. And I, I think I gave a lyric critique, which is so funny because mm -hmm. Brandon is actually much more anal about lyrics than I am. So for me, <laughs> even the first lyric critique, it's funny. Yeah. So we had we had this back and forth and it came up that we were both, we both loved Janelle Monet, And we both thought that the, um, the Cindy Mayweather art should be a musical. And so we ended up connecting really on that. And we were like, what if we like tried to do that? And we did not do that. <laughs> like we we came up with a whole huge drawing board of like what it would look like. And then this story, the story of Bari really took over and like yeah. really became its own thing. And a big part of that was us getting to makers. Like we applied to makers with a very like detailed idea, but like yeah. no music, no anything. And And we got really lucky that they knew us so they knew like the kind of caliber of work we created, but also that they yeah. just like took this leap of faith on us that I I hope has paid off. Like we've developed the work so much throughout our fellowship where now I feel like we've earned the right to call ourselves makers. But definitely yeah. at the beginning, we were just so grateful that we were given this chance to develop this piece we both really, we both really love. You're both so humble. I love how you, how you love <laughs> They 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 took a chance on us. Like I do feel like and they <laughs> really did. Honestly, but we get that about MTF a lot. You know, Jamie Jarrett said something very similar, and it's true. MTF well, takes and I argue this. with Jamie about it all the time. I'm like, yeah. well, Jamie, you're great. So well, like MTF, take, MTF takes risks on people that not everyone will, and it always pays off because mm -hmm. the stories are so special and they're so interesting. Yeah, definitely. Maybe so why? Like, there's so many 
organizational spaces that would have heard like time traveling and Arctic's Android musical and been like, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With like Pierce of Fellowship and that that's really the difference. Well, and it's so funny because even the first sketches of the music that we did, which only exist in vestigial voice sort of memo. structures. Um, voice memo. Most of the most of the original sketches, most people didn't understand. Um, one because they weren't completely full, but also we're playing with genres, we're mixing stuff, we're trying to do things a little differently, and you know, a sketch doesn't always honor right. what the whole song. So I think that's partly what's so exciting about being able to be a maker and, and go through that program is I got to play through my sketches and then really develop it into something that could live inside of that world. And the other so, members are so great. You mentioned yeah. Jamie, like they're all so wonderful. And the second group too. It's yes. so, because we were- Ronas Siddiqui like, is in the new group who we love. Yeah. It's, it's just Whitney White, like it's just, Whitney a, White. just a list of winners, honestly. Yeah. Like, I've heard all of their- I think Jalen Levingston is also in it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. So it was actually our director for this development process we did with Western Carolina University. Shout out to the Yes, Jalen! Um, and to, and to Jalen and like was an amazing director for this process. Um really helps with one of the songs that we'll be presenting tonight. Yeah. And for those people who don't know Jalen, um, he is the resident director of the of Tina, the Tina Turner musical. Um, yeah. and he's also the director of Shapeshifters, a queer comic book musical that we recently presented as well. So tell us more about Metropolis. Why did you want to tell this story, the story of Fari? What what is it? Why time traveling? I think, you know, initially we played around with for a little bit, trying to adapt the original Janelle Monae, uh, Cindy Mayweather arc. And so much of that arc is about a love story. And we just didn't want to write a love story and a superstar. And we didn't want to write that musical. I think we've seen that musical over and over and over again. And there's, there's not that's the not Janelle this. It, but those not the way that Janelle absolutely. does it, but still the idea of like a love story, there's so many other things to explore. And so once we said, okay, we don't want this to be centered around a person meeting a person and them falling in love, it opened up the other things that we wanted to have a conversation about through theater. And I think the most immediate things were the climate emergency and what it means to be dealing with feeling like the world is ending. I know we're like, everybody collectively agrees that the world is ending at this point, but what was it, 2018, the end of 2018, when we started working on this? Yeah. We were also feeling like this is kind of going south. It's it's not, we're not there yeah, yet, we but we seem to be going down. And that we need to, that we need to fix things and that things yeah. have, that there has to be this concentrated, um, deliberate effort to make the world better than it is because it can't stay like this. It's not sustainable. Yeah. And I think that really fueled a lot of the show as we got deeper into it. We we chose the time travel time travel aspect partially because we were thinking about what does time give you since we are on such a tight time schedule. Like mm -hmm. what what does time give you in perspective? What does it give you in generations? We talk all the time about how one of our characters is an ancestral character. Like she's living mm -hmm. so much closer to the time we're living in. But the way that she interacts with Fari is like this idea of an ant it's it's really like this energy of an ancestor. So what yeah. happens when we realize that yes, this moment is like really scary and it's very unique in the way mm -hmm. that um, it's manifesting, but also like our ancestors have gone through so many apocalypses before us. Yes. Like Jewish people, black people, Hispanic people, we have all like endured it spiritually, ancestrally, apocalypses before. And and so like, how, how did they survive? What lessons did they learn? What can we take and incorporate into our lives? And that's a big theme that shows up in Metropolis. I think the biggest thing I've, I said this to someone just today, every show I see about time travel, whether we're going to the past or the future, it's not that much different as we think it would be. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, and it's, I don't know if that's therapeutic or it's not. 
Yeah, it throws me off I, when I read when I read books and and watch movies from like the eight, like Parable of the Sower is the perfect example of this by Octavia mm-hmm. Butler. She wrote this in the eighties, and it's supposed to be happening in twenty twenty one. And when I tell you, it looks like twenty twenty one. I was. Yes. That, it makes me upset. <laughs> I was watching Back to the Future Part Two like a month or two ago, and I was like, oh, oh, okay, this is in yeah. <laughs> pretty much tracks, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and history is always repeating itself, just like it is right now, mm-hmm. you know, which is frightening and extraordinary and strange all at the same time. Oh, um, in addition to uh, the Musical Theater Factory's inaugural Makers cohort, um, tell us a little bit more about the show's development. Brennan, How do we, we talk about so the many- development? Yeah. yeah, it's honestly, it's like we talk about this all the, all the time, the show wants to happen like we want the show to happen mm-hmm. but the show also wants to happen so there are so many opportunities that happen because people watch that one video from the mcf gala that they showed yeah. or they met us randomly at a joe's pub concert and it's like what are you doing and so we've got in like we we did a lot of development through mcf directly we got to do a joe's pub concert which was really mm-hmm. wonderful we got to do a retreat we're now working with um, western carolina university and the like theater project to do some further development. And that has been absolutely incredible. The students yes. are so talented. The artistic director at um, New Light Theater Project has been so, so, so supportive and wonderful. Like reached out and was like, I, wa- I wanna help. Like, how do we help? And it has really followed through on that. Um, and we just did a, a small developmental process with Westland University that's going to result mm-hmm. in them doing a cabaret show. So it's lots of little stuff like that where people are like, this show, like, how do I help? And, um, yeah. and like, Pete, I mean, but it's resulted in, like, so much of the show getting done, like, for the Western Carolina yeah. U- University experience, we wrote a whole new song. And we have been really struggling with Fari. And yes. And oh, my gosh. And what song was going to be. Yeah. And we were like, we have to write one for this because we need someone young to sing it. And we're out of college. It's the time to do it. And it forced us to do it. And it's, like, I think one of the best songs we've written for the show. So, like, yeah. every little opportunity we've been given... And that one's a, a little more extensive, but every opportunity we've been given has really like helped us um, both in like building community around the show, which is really important to us, but also yeah. like in the actual creation of the work. I just want to well, shout out probably, the Western. Oh yeah, cool. you, I, was, I just want to say I want to shout out that your Western Carolina cast is on this chat tonight, making noise. Yes. We're going to see them soon, and then all the songs yeah. you're doing. Yes, yeah, I of want them. y'all to know that I did a deep listen to the tracks, what, last night for the first time. And I was like crying in the studio. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> I love so college funny. students so much. You just, you can count on them for anything. I just, they're the best. And the alum, um, too. It's not just students, it was students and alum. And, the, the and alum. So really incredible. They just are yes. so great. It's well, so oh, look at them. Oh, they're the best. Yes. I'm excited to lift up this material and see performances by these amazing Western Carolina University students and alums. So tell us about tonight's first song. Oh, yes. So Apocalyptic. No, Brandon, go. No. Yeah. No, I'll go. Great. About you so know. Apocalyptic Lit is the opener for act two of our musical. It starts um, in another time of revolution because the story of Metropolis takes place in two different re- revolutions that happen um, throughout mankind. And so it's really, really cool because we get to see a protest. I don't know that I want to give you more than yeah. that. It's the first song and first introduction to like this future world. And so much of Act One is like about like scientists and like academics and intellectuals. Mm-hmm. And so for us, it's exciting because Apocalyptic Lit is like movement people and it's a different energy. <laughs> it's just a whole different energy. So here is Apocalyptic Lit. Yeah, I think I just, I think I don't riff. I just hit the, I just hit it and then I. Y- yes. I'm just, I'm just gonna sing. All right, y'all, this is it. We've trained, we've plotted, we've prepared, and now here's our moment. The city needs a revolution and it's up to us to give it one. What we do here today 
is gonna change everything. All the humanoids, bios and androids, we need your attention and there's no need to mention that our goal is distraction, evoke a reaction, hide your face, ah, do your thing, let the riot trumpets ring. Let them know that the city is dying. Kill is kill and the rest are complying. Tear this shit down, make this bitch drown. Fuck it up like it's the end of the world. Hell yeah! No more hands in the air. Cause if the world is gonna end, we'll bend, we'll bend it till it breaks. Yeah, yeah! All my people everywhere. Cause if you didn't know before, be true, we're coming. So many lies, more than we realize And they'll keep a lying unless we begin crying So the goal is extraction, it's time to take action Grab and go, in and out, now it's not the time for doubt We will learn what the city's been hiding Doesn't tire, hey. doesn't take hey. a lunch break. Hey. It's the ultimate goon, changes the game. Truth. It catches like fire, shakes you like an earthquake, sweeps in like a monsoon. Nothing's the same ah. truth, yeah, we're gonna wield it. And, and no, they can shield it. We'll stop till they heal. And the city's filled with truth, cause truth will redeem it. We'll make what we dream it. We'll take the whole team. So let me hear you say. Again, that's everybody, and oh, wow, that's a great cast. It's basically oh, the first thing I thought when I was listening. It's a fight song. It's yes, yeah, very much yeah. so. Yeah, it was really nice to see that uh, that studio space. I've actually been to that college and worked with those students through Katya Stanislavskaya, and uh, those the students that I got to work with there were as incredible as well. Yeah. So let's and talk about our. Oh, you go. So I was just going to say Ashley Ross in there too, just like really being an advocate for the alums and like being like, oh, these students, like she really came in with like, we need to get these students and like, and and every single one of the students are just incredible and every single one yeah. of the alums is just all around wonderful. Also, hi, Jalen. Hi, Jalen. Hi. Hey, so what is our second song tonight? So our second song is Dinosaurs. Um, and it was one of the first times in the musical when we wrote it, it was one of the first times that we really understood what the moment was, like where we were, what was happening. Um, this is our act one closer. And so ha ha ha, you're seeing songs that go back to back. Um, so the world has ended. Our main character, well, our side character may not have accomplished what she wanted to accomplish and she's really sort of sitting with for the first time what that means for her and her character yeah and i think for what it's worth we consider right now we're considering that same thing i think um, a lot of folks are spending time really considering 
you know, what if the world isn't here in the next five years or in the next two years or mm -hmm. in the next year and, and, and what those realities are. And so you see a main character dealing with those same questions. Yeah, we have this juxtaposition between act one and act two of like, what does it mean to fail to save our world? And what does it mean to succeed? And so like, it is the song. I mean, and it's like, what does failure mean? Because like, he left mm -hmm. this moment of really being like, okay, I failed, but like, what what does that mean for Fari? And so hopefully it hits. <laughs> Here is Dinosaurs. Do I put the tea bag in first? Sorry. How do you make your tea? Yeah, I put the tea bag in first. Yeah. I think. Okay. It's been months since I saw the sky. I mean, really saw it. It's been months since I made some tea. God. It's a recurring joke between me and Brandon and my mother that we can't like listen to Emma sing this song once. Like you have to play it like three more times. <laughs> she, her voice is just so gorgeous. Yes. What's amazing about that song is that it appears to be a very complex song, but it's a very simple song with a really intricate uh, bass accompaniment motive. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just I love the metaphor of like, oh yeah, I wonder if the di I wonder how the dinosaurs felt when that was happening, or like, are we the dinosaurs of the next generation? Yeah, a lot of good. Absolutely. 
it's so funny because the part of the creation of the song it was originally, um, I believe, a monologue that that Art I wrote. It was a lyric um, that we didn't set for the four by fifteen. It was a lyric that we didn't set for the four by fifteen. With a four by fifteen with MTF, and we didn't set this lyric. I had written this lyric where I had said this, like, "Did the dinosaurs cry?" and then a whole bunch of words that Brandon was like, "Those words aren't important." And he wrote a new lyric that was so much better. <laughs> it was such a better lyric. And then what I like changed, I think, just a few words, and then the C section. And that's often we often go just like back and forth and back and forth. Um, and it helps that like that Brandon is so good at his shot. Because I think it's some, like, sometimes when people change my lyrics, I get a little, like, okay, but my lyric was good, though. But when Brandon did Dinosaurs, I was like, all right, you're right. This is it. <laughs> well, you certainly both have a really special collaboration, and we can't wait to see more from Metropolis. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, y'all. So fun to have both of them here. It was great. Yeah, what a special show. All right, well, and now on to the second half of our presentation, The King's Wife, which has music and lyrics by Grammy Award nominee Jamie Floyd and a book by Melissa Annis. Yes, The King's Wife uniquely retells the relationship between Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn, the first two wives of King Henry VIII of England. While historical accounts paint these women as bitter enemies, the king's wife, using historical clues, flips the script to tell the tale differently. The story begins with them as like-minded good friends, plotting and executing ideas for the people, and the future before they are stripped of choice, options, and each other in a devastating game of politics and power. It's an untraditional period piece with a dark, progressive vibe and a moving, hopeful story about female friendship and the, de and the detriment to the world when great women aren't allowed to rise. Oh, I love that sentence. Oh, yes. And now joining us from their homes are the writers of The King's Wife, Jamie Floyd and Melissa Annis. <clears throat> Hello. <Hi>. Hello. <laughs> We're so thrilled to have you both here and your uh, commercial producers are gonna be joining us shortly. So thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. We're thrilled to be here. <laughs> Jamie, you're joining us from your home in Nashville. Melissa, where are you? Oh, I'm in Brooklyn. So uh, not quite as glamorous as Nashville. I see your guitars <laughs> behind you, Jamie. I always think I need to adjust my background whenever we talk. <laughs> you're perfect, don't worry. <laughs> Well, it's really exciting that this new musical uh, has a female writing team and a female producing team. The story of Henry VIII and his wives are part of world history. I mean, we all know the story. Uh, history and legend have uh, converged over the past 470 years in our minds, in our literature, on our stages, uh, in films and in televisions, uh, in our homes. Um, this is ultimately an untold story and you, in a unique and sophisticated way are reclaiming this age old story um, from the perception of female friendship. So often uh, women at war are what people are, are selling. And this is you know, potentially about that, but it's ultimately about a friendship between two women that has been overlooked uh, through history. Um, before we, that we dive in, I just wanted to acknowledge that, Melissa, you're a storyteller who was born and raised in Wales. I am indeed. With we did our research. That's right. <laughs> uh, uh, by way of a bartender occasionally, I heard. <laughs> this is very uh, true. That's where my reputation precedes me, it seems. <laughs> you're a storyteller who was born and raised in Wales with ties as a writer, director, and dramaturg. You've worked at some of the country's most incredible theaters, and you've had your hand in plays, musicals, and Shakespearean works. And you also have a presence in the world of TV and print media. Wow, you really have been researching. I didn't tell you any of that stuff. <laughs> I looked on your website today. <laughs> <laughs> and Jamie, you are a Grammy-nominated songwriter, and your songs have been sung by Kesha, Brian McKnight, Miranda Lambert, Ronnie Dunn, among others. So is this your first time collaborating together? And what led you to want to tell this story together? Yeah, um, this is our first collaboration together, though I feel like Jamie has very quickly become a part of my family. So I hope it's the beginning of many collaborations together. Um, but yes, uh, so uh, one of our producers, Jen, actually approached us with the uh, story. 
or with the idea for the story of what if Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn were actually friends and not these women sort of wanting to kill each other or, or any of those things that we know. And in the beginning, I thought, oh gosh, how do we tell that story? Because, you know, being Welsh, I grew up amongst the castles and, you know, knowing the Tudors as the first Welsh line, I thought I knew the story backwards and forwards. And then um, we started looking at some source material and actually we realized that a lot of the stuff that we think we know are things that have been told to us secondhand by people with very much an agenda. And of course that sort of old adage of uh, whoever wins gets to tell the history. Well, that sort of is what happened here, we believe. So, so when Jamie and I started working on this, we just kept discovering, I think. Is that fair to say, Jamie? <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think the, <clears throat> the more that, that we learn about Catherine and Anne and, and what they did leave behind and kind of the breadcrumbs that they left, it's you start to piece things together differently. And um, Melissa has been such an incredible, you know, she, she's been such an incredible resource um, and, and, and helping me um, and introducing me oftentimes to, to certain things about, about Catherine that she had in the works that I didn't even know about, you know, like books and, and songs and all these different things. And so it's, it's been really beautiful to find that story out um, through some digging and, and to help put the puzzle pieces together. Yeah, and actually, um, Jamie introduced me to a book this week about music supremacy and how sometimes uh, the music, um, a lot of music goes by the wayside over history because, you know, the most dominant cultures take over and adapt music. And it's so interesting to think of our women in those terms because they were incredible women who used to write and commissioned incredible books for, you know, next generations. And of course, we never get to hear that part of the story. So that was fun to dive into and learn about more of that stuff. Well, tell us a little bit about um, how you came uh, to tell the story through this particular kind of a score. You know, I would say Jamie is like a guitar in a harpsichord world here. So what is, tell us more about uh, the score of the show. Sure, sure. Um, so this this is my first musical that I've ever been a part of. I've I've been real fortunate to to work with scripts in in film and television, but not in theater. Um, and so this was just a such a beautiful challenge. And and um, and along the way, so so as a songwriter, I started in Nashville. That's that's kind of where I've come up and where I've learned my the craft. And in Nashville, it's all about storytelling and, and the story is first. And I've just been very lucky to be surrounded by incredible storytellers, like the best in the world. All come to Nashville as far as songwriters, you know, and it's, uh, I feel like at some point or another, they weave their way here. And, and I've been lucky to, to be around a lot of them and to absorb all of um, all of that or some of that knowledge, I hope. And and so I've taken that foundation um, that makes country music so incredible and I've applied it to the theater world. And I think I've done the same thing when I got to write and pop music. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all helped me kind of find my way here <laughs> to where we are with the show. And, and I feel like I've, I coming from the commercial music world, I've been able to kind of take structure and things that, that work in pop songs and that help make things memorable and, and, and sing alongable <laughs> and and um, take take kind of the best parts that I think from commercial music and country music and try to infuse them and combine them with what makes theater so incredible. And, um, and it's been such a beautiful thing to, to, to be embraced by, by this community and to slowly become a part of it. I felt really welcome and so excited to, to keep exploring. Yeah, I think what I love about your score most is it doesn't sound like theater. I it's it's a musical, but it's it's really really unique in its own thing. And Melissa, how was it to write a book around that? Was it easy for you? Yeah, well, we've been working in tandem a lot, so it's less a case of it's not sort of jukeboxy in that way. You know, it's a case of that we'll come up with a couple of beats that we want to uh, work with in terms of storytelling, and then sometimes I'll bang out a few pages and say, Jamie, what can you do with this? And she'll say, look at this incredible anthem that I've created for the musical. I'm like, how did you do that? Um, so there's a lot of that that goes on. Um, and then of course it keeps evolving. Everybody who works in theater you know, knows that things keep changing. And I think that we keep changing as women and the world keeps changing. So the play as it sort of keeps growing, I feel like Jamie and I are constantly shifting the way that we work because you just have to in this crazy world. And emotionally, you have to just figure out different ways to hit different beats in the show, if that makes any sense. 
Sure, absolutely. Well, we're going to bring on your amazing producers now, Jennifer Grants and Abigail Solomon. Hi, guys. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, we're so glad to be here. I, I, we love this show. So. <laughs> Before Jen asks you a question, I just want to say it was so exciting to watch you both backstage as you were experiencing this, hearing us talk to them, and hearing the things that they would say, and to see how excited you would be about those things. So I just yeah. love you all love each other. It's wonderful. Yeah. So tell us more about the development of the show, Abigail and Jennifer. You have a lot of exciting things in the pipeline. Yes, we do. Um, uh, fill any blanks of missing, Abigail. You know, basically the first three years, um, we started this process in like late, late, late 2016, like almost 2017. And the first three years of the King's Wife development were really behind closed doors with trusted friends reading here and there. Um, and, you know, now we're sort of slowly uh, launching it out via our Instagram channel, like sharing music, and we've developed a real lovely fan base. If, if everybody wants to follow, it's at the King's Wife musical on Instagram. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so we're getting responses from fans and, and, so, and so forth in the industry also. So um, Jamie was able to explore some of the music in this year's new songs now with Rattlestick Theater, which is a company we love. Um, and also uh, the wonderful Playwrights Horizons is going to give us a 29 hour reading in the spring, which we're very excited about. And the, uh, the really sort of super spectacular director, Tamala Woodard is gonna uh, direct that for us. So um, uh, lots of things happening. We're having conversations with the UK and Australia producers in those territories um, for when the world reopens again, of course. <laughs> um, and yeah, you know, just just a lot uh, happening. And uh, you know, luckily, uh, you know, my my producing my dear producing partner in crime is 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 joining for this Abigail from Roslyn Productions. And you know, this is a show that really fits into both of our personal missions as producers. And why did you two think it was important to have an all female creative team? You know, you have a female producer, you have a female writing team. I think that's spectacular and so important to celebrate. We love women. <laughs> we do. Any day of the week. We like men too. For me personally, Rosin Productions, the mission is um, strong, unique female characters. And sometimes they're written well by men, and often they're written well by women. And that's what's so exciting. You know, the mission of my company is to change the narrative to eliminate gender and racial bias. And what's amazing about this story is I said to these ladies, they have literally, in gen, you know, the three of them who created this, I just came on along for the ride. Um, they literally have changed the narrative with a historical story that everybody knows. And nobody's heard this story before, really, the way they're telling it, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, and also it's, um, you know, it, there's a lot of like, it, the stories, you know, Melissa's book and the music at points is very humorous and uh, there's a lot to the story most certainly, but this is, it's a dark story. Like this is, you know, it, it's, there are some tough moments in this show. And, and you know, to be able to do that, we just really felt that it needed to be written by women who have not, of course, necessarily had Anne and Catherine's experiences, but have had experiences in the world that can potentially speak to what these two women go through. So um, from that standpoint, we really thought it was important to have, uh, you know, an all women team. I just remember being a kid and thinking, how could somebody order somebody to have their head cut off? Yeah. I like, mean, I mean, and Joe, quite honestly, that's not even the worst of it. You know, it's the fact that women had absolutely no choice whatsoever over mm -hmm. what they were allowed to do uh, with and for their own bodies. You know, well, it's it, all about, you know, having an heir. Yeah. And basically, we, that's all we were there for. So it's um, so it's really interesting now that we're in this time that we're sort of dealing with that idea of choice and ownership again and sort of how we can find agency and protect our rights, you know? And that's a lot of what the story is actually about. Yeah, it's incredibly moving, incredibly moving. What Jamie and Melissa have done is, you know, exciting, important, um, really, it's it's incredible. So we have two live performances by Jamie tonight. What is the first song we're gonna hear? Well, um, yeah. do you want to set her, set her no, up? No, I talk too much anyway. No, I was just gonna, I'll set it up, but you can tell us something else if I miss it out, if you like. Um, so this is a song called I Know You. And um, so Catherine of Aragon was actually pregnant seven times and uh, only one of her children lived. Uh, that would be Mary, the princess that most of us know as Bloody Mary. And um, so this song actually comes um, as she's just given birth to her seventh stillborn child. 
And Anne Boleyn is coming to her bedside and comforting her in this moment and trying to help her through this dark time. Here is Jamie. This is Anne. I find it hard. I have to remind myself not to mouth the words because I love that song so much. Well, Jamie C. Thank you for sharing that with us. I just wanted to say, you know, this source material is so fascinating. And the more um, you get to know it, the more incredible it is. You know, we've had, as you all know, we had Six the Musical that was to open on Broadway. Uh, Jesse and Steve Tomsko have written Berlin. Um, which is a, a musical about Anne Boleyn and told um, with, with a different musical palette as well. Um, but I think ultimately there's a place for all of us at the seat of uh, the, the table of the American theater. And this show is completely different from those shows and they are completely different from this show. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, you know, Six has a very different tone. So does Boleyn, so does The King's Wife. Um, and again, this is really a story about female friendship and seeing an old story in a new way as an untold story. Yeah, it was important to us to, of course, respect history. So we've tried to pepper in as much as we can of the uh, what we know. But what we really wanted to do was just sort of um, put a new lens on it and take away sort of the things that we've been told over the years and just look at it from a different angle. And just turn it around a little bit. And as you say, you know, there's space for all of the stories because we're all different and we're all telling them from different perspectives. And I think that that's okay and to be celebrated. Absolutely. And with that said, we do have a song that you are debuting tonight. So yes. about that song. This is so exciting. Um, this is a song that Jamie geniusly put together, what, 10 days ago, 14 days ago. <laughs> so it's brand new. Um, I don't think anyone's heard it yet, actually. I think it's, uh, yeah, really new. It's um, a duet. It'll eventually be a duet between Anne Boleyn and Catherine of Aragon. And basically, storytelling-wise, what happens is um, Catherine has commissioned a book, actually one of uh, a very well-known feminist book, 
um, to try and help her daughter master being a queen of the kingdom because ultimately she is the next in line. So, um, so this is uh, them realizing that they have a responsibility to get uh, Mary ready for uh, the throne. Here, once again, is Jamie. So this is called The Torch. There's so much more to conquer still. And the prayer I pray is that she will Take my place and carry on To challenge where the lines are drawn Life will tell her she doesn't count And when it does, she can't back down For generations our voice was lost The future ahead will be worth the cost We must go on and pass the torch and leave open doors Step by step, they will find what we left. This is what we came here for. To pass the touch. Pass the touch. Fires we start in our hearts will burn. Fires we start, we live on in her. Fires we start, in our hearts will burn. Always burn, always burn. Pass the touch. Oh. So that is our brand new, The Torch. <laughs> Thank you all so much for letting Yeah, we are so excited. For yeah, that. we are so excited for that. I have a little clip of, of some of the new verses and, and the chorus and where we're taking it. And um, I just, in writing all of these songs, I, and and again, reading the, the real quotes and things that we have um, from, from these women, you know, I, I, what's been really powerful is to remember that they, they were real people, you know, this is not, this is, I just, I've been trying to connect with, with that energy and that these women were, um, were, were brilliant, you know, and Catherine was this, this brilliant leader that just, um, was constantly having her dial turned down, you know, and I, um, it's just feels, I, I've been trying to, you know, you were saying this doesn't sound like, you know, a musical, these songs don't sound like it's, it's, um, I guess they don't they don't sound like um, a classic musical theater song and and that is because I'm trying to find Catherine and Anne's voices in this and maybe their voices sound different, you know, and that's why I'm listening. Let me try that out tonight. <laughs> so I think we wanna end. What about Anne Bolin and Catherine of Aragon do you wish more people knew? You know, why has their story been so complicated and sensationalized? Mm. Oh, what a great question. Um, I think that sex sells and the idea that Anna Boleyn was this vixen, this sort of um, power hungry woman with ambition, where have we heard that one before, um, <laughs> was very sexy uh, to a lot of people. And of course, we have to remember that um, Henry had, what, four more wives after Anne. So uh, he had a lot of uh, propaganda he had to push out there. And uh, so the thing that I've really discovered is how smart, smart. these women were. Um, incredibly intelligent and also creative women. Anne Boleyn wrote songs, she wrote operettas. Um, Catherine of Aragon could speak many languages as could um, Anne. And it's just, it's just been nice to be in the presence of brilliance and not sort of in the presence of the, these kind of flimsy characters that are always in the shadow of the king. And they're definitely, he's barely in our show. So it's quite nice to have them have a voice. At least that's what I think. That's been my discovery. I just want to also shout out um, Show Shepherd, our amazing board members, Blair and Matt, have been involved with your show. And we're so thankful that they brought the show to us. Yeah, we love those guys. <laughs> they're so great. And Jamie, you were going to say something. 
Oh, no, I was just going to say just just briefly, you're saying something that I learned. And this is something Melissa brought in, in our last uh, version of the draft. I'm reading it and and I get to this um, this scene that she incorporated about Catherine writing a book for for Mary. And and I was like tearing up and the scene, it just like hit me so hard and it felt it felt so real. And I <laughs> I, I called Melissa. And I was like, oh, I love this thing about the book oh my god how moving and she's like that's true <laughs> so it's just been incredible to see how she's, she's woven in these these facts about these women that, that i never knew about and that's one of them the, the book that Catherine was leaving behind for mary was really special and you just see what they were trying to do you know and, and i think what's really fun about working with jamie is that she'll get inspired by something I find and then she'll go down a whole rabbit hole hunt and then I'll get inspired by something she finds and then it ends up being like a week of oh my gosh look at all this stuff it's like a treasure trove yeah, because of that book because of her finding that piece of history that's how I was able to write the torch that's what it inspired in me and so um yeah these they, it all kind of weaves together but, but Melissa and I have had a, an incredible chemistry from the very beginning it's been Enjoy. I just gotta flash this comment one more time because it's it's so on. <laughs> <laughs> and with that yeah. said, thank you all for resurrecting the ghosts of these women to sort of almost change history and almost to inform our future uh, and to make it better for for the women in our in our world. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you yes. for having us. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for having us. And we'll shout see. out to Metropolis. It's amazing. Yes. <laughs> we'll see you guys soon. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye, everyone. You know, I said earlier that uh, the writers of Metropolis, a lot of their work sort of meets at the intersection of art and policy. But, you know, it seems that both stories really do. Absolutely. Well, that's our show for tonight. We will be back next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. with the new musicals The Clearwaters and Little Duende. Yes, The Clearwaters is written by Russ Kaplan, Daniel John Kelly, and Sarah Wordsworth. And Russ and Sarah are two of the writers of Entrancet, and we are excited to have them be a part of the New York Theatre Barn family again. And Little Duende is written by Robbie Hager and Georgina Escobar. And Robbie is also a performer, as you might know, and we were excited to have him a part of Zoe Sarnik's presentation of A Crossing just this past summer. And we look forward to welcoming him back to New York Theatre Barn as a writer this time. That's right. I had no idea who was a writer and he's such a talented performer. So I'm excited to see that he's telling stories. Um, it takes an incredible amount of work to make tonight's show happen. And in order to continue to lift up artists and original musicals, we really need your help. Please join our generous donors by making your gift today on our website at nytheaterbarn.org slash give. Again, that link is nytheaterbarn.org slash give. It is right on the bottom of your screen right now. Thank you for tuning in tonight, and we look forward to seeing you Monday at our Choreography Lab. That's right. We can't wait to hear more from The King's Wife and Metropolis. So thank you for supporting live theater. Good night. Good night. New York Theatre Barn has provided an amazing space for the development of original new works. Not just as a woman, but as a queer woman, I've been supported at New York Theatre Barn. So I really feel thankful that um, I've gotten to present this because I feel like as I've been able to take up more space in different rooms, this, music, this musical's allowed me to do that. So it's the power of new work, the magic of new work. And wanted to say a huge thank you to Joe Barros and everyone at New York Theatre Barn for being a creative home to so many artists and incubating such exciting new work. Well, I want to thank you and Jen for having us on the show today. Um, if I had known what goes into doing these things, I would have, I don't know what I would have thought. First of all, <laughs> you two are both like Mr. Wizard. You're just unbelievable. And <laughs> all of the technical stuff that is involved with putting these new work series together and our special uh, event tonight, uh, it's just overwhelming and astounding. You both are phenomenal. So thank you so very much. I applaud you both. You're amazing. Thank you for me too. Thank you for mm -hmm. me too.